My name is Bill Shambay. I've worked in the wine distribution business in New York for over 30 years. I'm currently chairman of Verity Wine Partners. I also have a consulting business um, impor advising importers and distributors on management and leadership training that's specific to our industry. So how many of you out there in the audience currently own or work for a distributor? Raise your hands, okay. Um, Oh, I need the clicker. Come on. There we go. So you know how competitive the wine market has become. It's crowded, right? It's really crowded. And why is that? Well, there's a lot more wine available today than there was 40 years ago. There are about 110,000 wines available in the US, according to the TTB, which is up from 47,000 20 years ago. What's more, there are a lot more importers representing all those wines. The TTB lists about 10,000 importers currently of wine, spirits, and beer. Somewhere around six to 7,000 of them handle wine. The, uh, the rest is just beer and spirits. Um, who wants to tell me how many wholesale wine and spirits distributors there are in the US? Any guesses? 550, anybody else? Well, according to WSWA, there are currently about 3,000 distributor licenses in the United States. Now, about 300 of those are multiple licenses owned by one distributor, like Southern Glaciers, Breakthrough, et cetera. That leaves us with about 2,700 distributors nationwide. And that's down from 3,000 about 20 years ago. So it's shrunk slightly, but not that much. There are also more wines available in New York today than there were 40 years ago. Um, there are about 80,000 wines available in New York right now. Does that surprise anyone? I mean, that seems like a big number to me, and I'm in the business all the time. But that, if we, we did our research, and there are about 80,000 available at any given time. Now, we said there's more importers nationally, but there are also a number of importers who hold distribution licenses in New York State. For instance, Dreyfus Ashby, Palm Bay, some of the large importers have their own distri distri distributors in New York, which is not that unusual for big states. And while we know that the number of distributors nationwide has shrunk slightly, the number of distributors in New York has actually grown. So it's roughly doubled over the last 40 years from 110 to 225. So what we have is this inverted pyramid with more wines being funneled down through a growing number of importers and into a steady if not shrinking number of distributors. The good news is consumption of wine in the US has increased dramatically. I, th I think you've probably all seen this graph. Um, since 1978, it's up 116%, 440 million gallons to what they're projecting to be 960 million gallons today. So people are drinking more wine. Um, but while they're drinking more wine, that it hasn't kept pace with the number of wines available in the US. Remember we said there are currently about 110,000 wines available? In 1979, there were only about 17,000. So while consumption's up by 116%, the number of wines is up by 550%. So there's a real discrepancy here. Right now, the pressure you're feeling as a distributor, for you distributors, comes from the fact that there are more quality wines available in this market, and the US in general, than there are interested consumers to purchase them. Remember the, the discrepancy between 115% and 550%. And if you're an importer, you're having difficulty, tremendous difficulty, finding distributors with room in their portfolio to carry your brands, am I right? I mean, remember, since 1998, the number of distributors has shrunk slightly. At the same time, the number of available wines has more than doubled. So as a distributor, what's your current situation? 
Well, you probably operate in a crowded, highly competitive market. If, like most distributors, you're trying to grow and keep your supplier base, distinguishing yourself by always looking for the next hot new brand that's going to make you money and get your company noticed. You're also trying to grow sales in your territory, usually at some rate determined by factors way beyond your control, like the, the economy, supply shortages, and market trends that you or I didn't anticipate. So you make it your mission to make every supplier happy. You work at paying attention to the little guys who make your portfolio interesting, and you're managing goals from your biggest suppliers. You're committed to keeping gross profits up, but supplier pressures keep pushing your margins down. So this is what your life looks like. It's a balancing act between pricing your wines to sell and keeping your profits up. It's always a balancing act. Finally, you have to manage your biggest source of unavailable cash. And any of you who own distributors know this. Um, your inventory. At the same time, suppliers keep urging you to carry more wines and more products, and this is probably your biggest challenge. So there are four major forces dominating your business, which are going to cause you pain if not managed correctly. So the first one, revenue. 80 percent, whoops, revenue. 80 percent of your business comes from 20 percent of your suppliers. Their key items or brands are the foundation of your company's sales. Think about that. The top 20% of your suppliers are your foundation brands. Identify the top 20%. By all means, take care of them, but you can't neglect the other 80%, right? Because that's what makes your portfolio interesting and attractive to customers. Inventory, long tail inventories put pressure on your cash flow, but you're afraid to run out of, any, out of anything for fear of disappointing your customers. And, and who are the first people to let you know when you run out of inventory? Your salespeople, right? You get calls, you get emails, we're out of this, we're out of that. They can't sell to their customers. It's, it's, it's a constant problem. Growth, number three is growth. Organic growth, year over year, what we call same store analysis, is a limited path to growth. Only by expanding your sales footprint, that is expanding into new territories or acquiring new brands, do you dramatically impact your growth rate. And pricing. You all know by gut instinct what price point every brand will optimize sales. And you need to find a way to make a profit regardless of that downward pressure on prices. So remember, I said not managing these major forces would be painful. So how does that pain look? Well, it can take a lot of forms. And some, some of you may have all of these or some of these under control. But like, if you're like most companies in this sector, these are the most common pain points. Falling short of company goals, not making your revenue numbers each month. Failure to deliver on sales objectives. Disappointing your suppliers with lackluster depletions. Your sales staff are overwhelmed by product mix, and they can't, just can't seem to sell the whole book, right? Your sales staff are undertrained, unproductive, or unaccountable. And you know your staff should be doing better. And productivity is lower than it could be. And there you are, leaving money on the table. So. Managing the daily grind of business, it's easy to lose sight of your objectives, you can, and you can commit two very common mistakes. You listen to the most irate or the most recently irate supplier who's calling you to find out why his depletions are lower than last year. And then you do something really stupid, and you call your managers in. You hand them a quickly composed set of last-minute goals. And how many of you have done that? Right? Once you've done that, though, your sales force just feels like they're being used, and they don't feel like they have any ownership of the goals. So beyond the pain, what are the symptoms? Well, you may have seen some or all of these symptoms in your organization. 
Angry suppliers and angry customers, fire drills, impossible goals and deadlines, which leads to frustration, anger, and resentment. These are big red flags that should tell you you need to reevaluate your systems and procedures and work to solve the root problem. So, what's the worst case scenario? Suppliers pull their business, sales staff leaves for greener pastures, and which perpetuates a negative feedback loop that never ends well. I call it the death spiral. I've seen some distributors do this, and it, it's terrible to watch, but it's what can happen if you don't take care of these problems before they get to be too bad. This is not the world we want to live in, though. We all want better outcomes for our business. So what does an ideal world look like? Well, welcome to my ideal world. Your employees are engaged. Your sales staff is engaged. Your company goals are clear. Your company enjoys a strong reputation with both customers and suppliers. This is what we all want for our companies. Let me go back, let me go back to that first line up there. Um, employees are awake and engaged. Um, let me address the concept of engagement for a moment. In a recent Gallup study, 100,000 employees or workers were surveyed. They found that one third of those employees, one third, were what Gallup calls engaged at work. They love their jobs, they make their organization better every day. You know who those people are, those top performers in your company. On the other hand, 16% of surveyed employees were actively disengaged. I mean, th that means they are miserable in the workplace and they wind up destroying the goodwill that those most engaged employees wind up building. And the remaining 51%, a little more than half, this amazed me, are not engaged, they're just there. They're just there to collect a paycheck. That's the state of the American workforce right now. And I know you see, you probably see in your own employees one of those three categories up there. So, how do we create an ideal world? As a coach and a leader, your most important function is to motivate your people and your employees. Ben Salisbury identified a crucial key to understanding how to get the most out of people, whether it's customers or employees. He said you can get anything you want in life if you're willing to help enough other people get what they want. Let that sink in for a minute. If you want to be an effective leader, put your wants and needs at the back of the line and help other people first. Help your employees succeed in life and they'll walk on hot coals for you and your organization. Help your customers succeed, and they're going to come back to you time and time again. So, come on. There we go. Um, I'm going to give you 12 guidelines to apply to your distributor sales organization. Four, which will dramatically improve your culture. Three, which will improve your processes and five strategies to make you better at execution. All right, sales are priority one. If you're willing to help your customers get what they want, and this goes back to Ben Salisbury's quote, your business is gonna thrive. What does that mean? Giving them quality products delivered on time and at prices that make them profitable, okay? Every department in your company should be helping your sales effort. Customer service, brand management, marketing, accounting, warehouse and trucking all need to believe that sales is part of their job. If they don't, you're not gonna be a successful sales company. How many of you have had a, a, a really disturbing incident with a, with a driver or a delivery person or a customer service person that unravels all the, all the goodwill you've done to gain that customer. Raise your hands. I know it, it, it happens every day. We don't want it to, but it does happen. But the way, to, the way to counter that is make sure everybody in your sales organization, under, in your company, understands that you're a sales organization and that sales are the most important thing. 
and anyone along the, the chain of, from taking an order to delivery of that order can break that chain, and you don't want that to happen. Establish a coaching culture. Okay, the latest Gallup research shows that continuous training and education as an everyday exercise called performance development is much more effective than annual performance reviews. Waiting until the end of the year to, perform, to, to review performance is too late. Okay, you and your management team needs to be coaching every day. Implementing performance development creates a cultural shift, not only in how people work, but how they work together. And moving from traditional management to what I like to call performance development requires managers to think of themselves as coaches, not bosses. Gallup did another study recently. They, they studied several hundred thousand millennials. And one of the primary focus points they came up with about their jobs is they don't want a boss. They want a coach. And millennials are now the largest segment of employees in our country. And they look at their jobs very differently. So what would happen if a basketball coach waited until the end of the game or the end of the season to give each player a performance review? That'd be crazy, right? Coaches give minute-by-minute -minute instructions on the court. They review performance at the end of each game. They don't just critique a team at the end of the season, and managers shouldn't do it either. Okay, and number three, embrace a philosophy of developing strengths versus fixing weaknesses. It's the job of a great manager or coach to develop employee strengths and channel that energy in ways which fulfill the goals and objectives of the company while minimizing distribution to your organization, or um, disruption to your organization. Focus on what's right with people and stop trying to fix what's wrong with them. You're gonna be frustrated and you're not likely to fix them anyway. For example, I'll give you an example of a salesperson in, in, in my history, I'll, I'll, I'll sort of make it generic. I had a salesperson who was very knowledgeable about wine, highly motivated, somewhat eccentric. You all know that person. She gets along well with customers, mostly restaurateurs who are entrepreneurial, artistic, and someone that's eccentric themselves. Put her in a large store with a corporate mindset, and she usually fails at making a connection. But her regular customers would tell me how much they love her. They adored her. They were loyal to her, and she did great business with those customers. So instead of trying to change her personality, you're just wasting your time. I simply would send a different salesperson in to those accounts who don't find a connection with her. You have happy sales reps, happy customers. It all makes for good business. So, number four, training and education distinguish top performers. The best companies teach their employees how to work. Don't assume your people know how to manage their time and how to prioritize their workflow. Training your employees in the basics of selling should not be overlooked. We spend a lot of time in this business teaching our employees about wine. Don't forget, we're all sales organizations and we assume that they know how to sell. Coach them, get them professional help if necessary, but teach them about sales too. Clearly, back to my last point, in our business, Wine education is prime currency. So invest in your employees, whether it means sponsoring trips to wine regions, subsidizing WSET courses, make your sales staff the best informed on the street. And finally, understand the difference between skill and talent. Skills can be taught. Talent is innate. It can't be taught, but it can be directed. Okay, so whatever talent your employees come with, that's what they've got. You can teach them other skills, though. Number five, 
And this is one that I get, I get yelled at by other people in the business and managers. Give everyone in the organiz organization the responsibility and the authority to solve problems. It's not enough to give employees responsibility without giving them authority. It's one of, and it's one of the hardest things for corporate managers to do, to give up authority. We hate doing it. Believe me, it works. Another big mistake is losing sight of your goal and your mission. Whether you're talking about customer service or sales, don't lose sight of the fact that eventually you have to serve the customer. Therefore, the best organizations follow procedure 90% of the time. The other 10% of the time, I empower employees to break the rules in order to ensure a positive outcome for the customer. I always tell my people, we make the rules, we can break the rules, okay? If we've made a rule and a procedure that's going to result in a customer getting really angry, dropping us, whatever, if it's appropriate, you have the authority to break the rules and make that customer happy. There are many organizations out there, department stores, Amazon, companies who live by that mantra. Make the customer happy almost at all costs. Of course, in our industry, there are laws. You can't break the laws. But you can break the rules if you made them. A cohesive, consistent process which serves the customer, not the organization. And this builds on the last slide. And what I mean by this is if you're making rules and procedures that serve, that make your job easier or your employees' jobs easier, you're not focusing on the customer or your suppliers. Don't put in place procedures that make your life easier. Put in place procedures that make your customer's life easier. Take obstacles out of their way. Amazon CEO Jeff Bezos explains that as companies grow, it becomes easier to rely on process rather than results. In which case, the process becomes the thing, or what he likes to call a proxy. In other words, the process takes the place of the desired result and usually ends in failure. When this happens to companies, they stop looking at outcomes and they only consider whether they've followed the process correctly. Okay, an extreme example of this happened to United Airlines last year. You all remember this. UAL forcibly removed a doctor from a plane in order to make room for four United employees. What a PR mess. And the most amazing fact of the case, though, was when they, during the investigation into what happened, when they interviewed those UAL employees, they all said they followed the procedures. Well, the procedures don't work if that's what happens. If the end result is that kind of a disaster, then you need to break the rules, all right? Planning and maintenance versus fire drills and breakdowns. This drives me crazy. It drives some of my suppliers crazy too um, because sometimes they come to me with a fire drill and I say, we don't do fire drills here. We plan ahead. And if you didn't plan ahead, next time you will because we're not doing a fire drill. So if you're gonna run a successful sales organization, you have to know what you plan to accomplish in yearly, quarterly, and monthly buckets. And you need to take those goals and build an action plan for each one. Planning to succeed rather than trying not to fail. I see so many companies who the best they can do is just try not to fail. That's not good enough. You need to plan to succeed. Action plans made up in advance are far more successful than what I like to call reaction plans. Am I right? Number eight, successful sales goals are bottom up. That is, they start with the customer or the sales rep and they flow up, not the other way around. If, if sales reps participate in the process, they will own the results. And remember, goals can't be seat of the pants. You can't just set goals because you think that's where you need to be. 
you need to set SMART goals, what I like to call SMART goals, and this is, I didn't make this up, this is standard um, sales practice. SMART goals are specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and with a time stamp on them, time specific. Those are SMART goals. If you've just thrown out a number without putting a time period on it uh, or measuring it, then it's not a goal, it's just an idea. Then hold people accountable. Track, reward, and recognize performance. Too many companies put goals out there and then and they say, and it's a three month program, and you know, on day 89 of a 90 day program, somebody posts a, uh, a, a status update. That's not good enough. Always provide up to the minute tracking and reporting. There's no excuse for not giving your sales staff daily updates. With business intelligence platforms the way they are nowadays, you, you can do so many things automatically. You should be able to deliver that information to their inbox or via a company dashboard every single day. Number nine, align individual goals with company goals. Research shows individuals and teams perform better when an employee is responsible for both individual and team goals. It drives me nuts when I have suppliers or someone wants to give my managers a goal but the salespeople are working on something else. It, it never works out. The work individuals perform and the goals they pursue should align with the purpose and goals of their team and organization. It's just, that's the way it needs to be. Employees need to understand that their company's, oops, sorry, that their company's strategy and values so they can see a connection between their performance and the company's success. And to bundle all this up, there should be a shared comprehensive sales and marketing calendar in one place that's visible where everyone can see the company's top priorities and programs from top to bottom for every quarter and every month. This is essential. Think about the big thermometer that you see out in front of your local fire department when they're trying to reach a, a goal, a, a, a charity donation goal. That should be in your mind when you, when you think about running a program, setting goals, and letting everybody know. Post it on the bulletin boards, so to speak. It, nowadays, it's on everybody's laptop and computer. Make sure everybody knows the status of the program every day and who's contributing. Oops. There we go. Number 10, enlist your supplier partners to participate in the, in the negotiation and fulfillment of goals. All right, find out what they're asking for. Is it reasonable? Is there a timetable? What do your suppliers bring to the table to help you achieve those goals? Do they offer incentives, depletion allowances, other marketing support? Outline what your organization brings. Incentives, tracking, at the very least, a commitment to success and insist on a customized written marketing plan for each supplier detailing those goals and objectives. Brand management, sales management, and marketing should all have a seat at the table when negotiating goals. Think about that. Don't think that you alone as the boss can sit in a meeting with suppliers and credibly promise to deliver on a sales plan. You can't. Your whole team has to be invested in it. Have accounting and logistics sign off on it. And this is something almost no one does. To secure that the back of the house can support the goals. Can you get the inventory here in time? Did you just promise something that you can't even deliver, your logistics department can't even deliver? Is your GP in line? Have you budgeted the money for purchasing? These things should be checked. I'm not saying the back of the house should run sales. I'm very much a proponent of the opposite case. But you have a team. Use the whole team. So resist the idea that one person or one department can speak for all the stakeholders. Integration is key. Integration of the process is key to success. And finally, turn supplier goals into executable sales plans and strategies. 
Okay, I'll say that again. Turn supplier goals into executable sales plans. Think about it. This is your primary function as a wholesale distributor. It's your job to take your supplier's goals and ambitions, what they want to do in your market, and work out an executable sales and marketing plan tailored to your territory, which will get the supplier to their stated goal. That's what they need you for. And if you're not delivering on this single objective, then you're not fulfilling your role, role as a distributor. Some of the things that go under that is to manage the supply chain, plan for inventory, understand how your plan affects gross profit and gross margin, devise pricing and incentives which will lead to success, evaluate the likelihood of failures in achieving the goals, figure out where the, pit, uh, the potholes are, sign off on objectives and fit them into the overall marketing plan, and then troubleshoot the calendar conflicts. You know, what else do you have going on? Don't run overlapping sales plans that conflict with each other. And that is my presentation today. Do we, can I ask Lauren, do we have time for questions or is, we've got to roll into the next speaker? Okay, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to take questions from the audience. No questions. Wow, you guys are good. Okay, thank you very much. Um, if, I believe these um, presentations will be online at some point in the future, both the um, video and the presentations themselves. Am I right? Okay. Yes. Yes. Oh my God. Um, talent. Um, talent is probably the first one because that's the one you can't teach. Skills you can teach. Talent you can't teach. Um, if they don't have talent and motivation, those are the two. I mean, in higher, I have a whole, I have a whole other lecture on just how to hire people. Um, and um, that's a chapter in a book. But talent and motivation are the two most important because you can't. You cannot teach those. And motivation, motivation is learned, but it's learned at a young age, and it's learned by experience. And once someone's motivational meter is set in adulthood, it generally doesn't change unless some large life-altering experience happens to them. So those are the two most important. I could teach anybody about wine. And in fact, some of my best salespeople didn't care that much about wine. They were great salespeople. They learned enough to do the job, but they were highly motivated and they had talent. Yes? You're talking about salespeople. How do you engage your salespeople to educate your customer, your retailer, when it comes to wine or spirits? That's a big challenge to get the retailer involved in your brand when they have the evidence in front of them to make that brand attractive. Wow. <laughs> Yes. Well, what, I mean, one of, the, one of the slides I had up here was um, help your customer do their job better and they'll come back to you. And all part of helping the customer is educating them. How do you get them to do that? You talk to them. You bring them samples. You, uh, you, you point out the fact that, wow, you have, um, you have a number of Austrian wines, but you don't have any of the reds. Um, or you have... Um, you have a bunch of California Chardonnays, but you have nothing from Santa Maria, which is a very hot area. Uh, they need to, to gently point out the holes in the retailer's um, philo uh, buying philosophy or, his, or what he's missing on the shelf. I mean, there are a lot of ways to do that. Uh, that's a tough question. Yeah, generally, motivated salespeople will find a way to motivate their customers. Other questions? Hand raised over here. I can't quite hear you. I'm sorry. Faults immediately, immediately make good on it. I mean, you need to take it back, make a credit, log the log the 
log the, uh, the problem product, make sure that the supplier knows that there was a problem. I mean, we have, we have certain limitations in New York State with the law about how long uh, after a product's delivered that you can pick it up. But I know that the SLA, if you literally, um, I've done this, if it's, th th we sold somebody five cases of wine and it took them three months to go through it and two bottles came back corked. That's beyond the time limit that the SLA technically allows you to pick it up. I've sent a letter to the SLA or an email and they have a help desk. And you can say, look, I had these two bottles, they were in here, we wanna pick them up. Do we have permission? They always say yes. They always say yes. As long as you document it, you tell them the invoice number. I mean, it, it's, a, it's an extra step, but if you want to stay completely within the white lines of the law, that's what you do, and they do respond. Any other questions? Okay. Lauren? Go ahead.